scarcely a writer more interested in play and in playing games with his readers than the Argentine Jorge Luis Borges. It can be hard to tell when he's serious. Equally, it can be hard to tell when he's joking. Indeed, one of the characteristics of his work is that it takes play, in all senses of the term, seriously. At the same time that it plays with, or seeks the play in, what is serious, whether that be mortality, theology, philosophy, or what for Borges is the particularly serious question of literature. Among other things, Borges plays with genre, with the forms that writing can take, and also what the reader expects of it, for the cues provided by genre are, in the end, ways of managing a reader's expectations. Labyrinths, which was the first substantial collection of Borges's work to appear in English, first published in 1962, but periodically augmented and revised thereafter, draws from four of Borges's books in Spanish. It includes most of Ficciones and El Aleph, which the translators call stories, a smaller selection from Discusión and Otras Inquisiciones, classified as essays, and a few texts from El Hacedor, grouped under the heading Parables. But the forms bleed into each other. Many of the stories are presented as essays, or as history, chronicle, memoir, or confession. The essays are often as much experiments in thought and style as other stories. Meanwhile, the parables are distinguished mostly because they're simply shorter, a consequence of the fact that Borges had gone blind after half a lifetime of steadily deteriorating vision by the time he wrote, or rather, dictated them. Often, Borges returns to similar concerns, but in different genres or forms. Amid all the variation in style, there is also much repetition in his work. But this is as much theme as style. Borges is interested in difference and repetition, in the secrets that we do not notice the first time around, but which we may discover have been evident all along. Hence his stories are always worth reading more than once. It is perhaps no coincidence that a man who was losing his sight should be fascinated by how we can so easily by be fooled by what we think we see, by what we believe to be obvious. His games often challenge convention and common sense, teasing out contradictions by taking ideas to their logical extremes. He exposes secret complicities, as when apparent oppositions hide more fundamental similarities. But he's also concerned with how novelty and change emerge from repetition, how real difference arises from the most minor of variations. For a writer who is often viewed as conservative, in both habits and expressed political opinions, Borges proves surprisingly attentive to the possible conditions for social and other change. His stories are not simply exercises in intellectual ingenuity. At the centre of every labyrinth, life and death are at stake. In Borges and I, a very short, quasi-autobiographical text, in which the author, I, distinguishes himself from the writer or public figure, the one whose name, Borges, appears on the front covers of his books. Borges, or is it I, provides a brief capsule summary of his career to date. Years ago, I tried to free myself from him, Borges and went from the mythologies of the outskirts to the games with time and infinity. But those games belong to Borges now, and I shall have to imagine other things. By outskirts, Arabal, Borges means the rough suburbs of a rapidly expanding early 20th century Buenos Aires, 
where the country was being overtaken by the city, and haunt of gangsters and ruffians who once thrived in this retreating milieu. We see something of this landscape in the detective story Death in the Compass. To the left and the right of the automobile, the city disintegrated, the firmament grew, and houses were of less importance than a brick kiln or a poplar tree. It is here that the body is found, a deep knife wound in his breast, of one Daniel Simon Acevedo, the last representative of a generation of bandits who knew how to manipulate a dagger, but not a revolver. But in these stories we equally see the games of time and infinity, with which Borges' name is ultimately associated, especially abroad. In The Secret Miracle, for instance, time stands still, as a man, sentenced to death by firing squad, is mysteriously granted a year, while he and everything around him is paralysed, stuck in the moment, in which he is able to complete in his head the verse drama he has been working on. Meticulously, motionlessly, secretly, he wrought in time his lofty, invisible labyrinth. The Library of Babel, meanwhile, describes a library that is a universe, containing every possible book, in all possible languages, and in all possible variations. Made up of hexagons like a beehive, the library is a sphere whose exact centre is any one of its hexagons, and whose circumference is inaccessible. Not that the violence of the Arabal is entirely absent in this rarefied environment of infinite books. Stirred up by the search for the volume that would vindicate them, some librarians disputed in the narrow corridors, proffered dark curses, strangled each other in the divine stairways, flung the deceptive books into the air shafts, met their deaths cast down in a similar fashion by the inhabitants of remote regions. Others went mad. Indeed, throughout these stories, the twin motifs of sudden arbitrary death and esoteric ratiocination run hand in hand. These games can be, quite literally, deadly. In short, the distinction that Borges and I proposes between mythologies of the outskirts and games of time and infinity is, like the distinction that the parable posits in its title between author and writer, unstable and uncertain. No sooner does Borges establish a difference than he questions and undermines it. What is dissimilar, even diametrically opposed, comes to take on the characteristics of its opposite. I wonder if you see any other examples of this, of stories in which distinctions are blurred, difference becomes repetition, and the other emerges as mirror image or more of the same. Pick a story. Think about how this logic unfolds and write down some notes. Again, feel free to add them also in the comments to this video. While you do that, I'll have a mate, but I'll be right back. One instance of a story which Borges plays of collapsing distinctions is three versions of Judas. Again, this is a text that lacks many of the features we associate with stories, being without much in the way of plot or characterization. It reads instead as abstruse intellectual history, describing in sometimes tedious detail the life and work of a Swedish theologian, Niels Runeberg, replete with footnotes and citations, as well as learned discussion of theological niceties. 
at the arguments that Rundberg is portrayed as advancing, threaten to overturn one of the fundamental narratives of Western culture, the story of the Incarnation and Passion of Christ. For the theologian expands monstrously on the claim about Christ's betrayer, Judas Iscariot, made by English Romantic essayist Thomas de Quincey, most famous for Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Everything connected with our ordinary conceptions of this man, of his real purposes, and of his ultimate fate, apparently is erroneous. Rundberg's analyses of Judas, renowned over the millennia as epitome of treason, selling Christ out for 30 pieces of silver, focus on the disgraced apostle's own sacrifice, that in fact, in the theologian's first approach to the problem, reflects that of Jesus, an earthly mirror, essential to the divine plan. In subsequent elaboration, Runeberg's hypothesis is more provocative still. Not only is Judas like the Messiah, Judas is the Messiah. In this new account of the Incarnation, of the Word became flesh, God made himself totally a man, but a man to the point of infamy, a man to the point of reprobation and the abyss. He could have been Alexander or Pythagoras or Rurik or Jesus. He chose the vilest destiny of all. He was Judas. Judas, not Jesus, dies to save our sins. Everything we thought we knew is wrong. Up is down, left is right. For a lover of paradoxes, <clears throat> ironies and contradictions, and Bork is certainly delighted in all three, this transposition of reviled human into secret divinity is very neat, and from the right perspective, wryly amusing. Other stories perform similar inversions, upending expectations and common sense. In Theme of the Traitor and the Hero, for instance, the hero of the tale turns out to be, in fact, the traitor, though he redeems himself and becomes implicitly once more heroic by acting out a strange drama in which history imitates art. In The Circular Ruins, a man tries to attain almost divine magical powers by dreaming up another living being, only to discover that he himself has been dreamt up by another. In Death in the Compass, the detective ends up the victim, outsmarted by a criminal who uses his own methods against him. Borges is expert in the second look, asking us to think again, to reconsider what we think we know. He is the eternal skeptic. If unlike can be like, if difference can turn out to be repetition or similarity, then like can equally end up in Borges's hands as unlike. Or rather, sometimes the most infinitesimal distinction can turn out to have surprising significance. This, after all, is the premise of Borges and I. The self is split. I is not quite Borges, and Borges is not quite I. I like hourglasses, maps, 18th century typography, the taste of coffee and the prose of Stevenson, we are told. He, Borges, shares these preferences, but in a vain way that turns them into the attributes of an actor. The two are similar, perhaps at first sight identical, surrounded by the same accoutrement, but one is more of an actor, merely imitating or simulating with a vanity that indicates too much self-consciousness. Being too conscious of oneself also distance one from the self as you begin to perceive yourself as other. The gap that opens up within the self is not exactly intolerable, 
It would be an exaggeration to say that ours is a hostile relationship. But something escapes, and something is lost. My life is a flight, and I lose everything, and everything belongs to oblivion, or to him. The difference between the two, within a now fragmented and lost unity, is both definite and incalculable, undecidable. I do not know which of us has written this page. As so often in Borges, almost everything comes down to writing. I who write can no longer locate myself with any certainty in what I have written. Through writing, I leave a trace in the world, but at the cost of a self-alienation, as that trace is absorbed, at best, into the language and tradition. The best that one could hope is to become impersonal, common, to produce a text that others will cite, consciously or otherwise, and thereby also appropriate. Borges explores further these concerns about legacy and inheritance, and at the same time takes the proposition about the significance of minimal differences to its extreme in Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. This story purports, in the first instance, to be the catalogue of an otherwise little-known French writer's literary legacy. The narrator lists this Pierre Menard's visible work, which ranges from poetry to aesthetic theory to translation. Menard has also left the world a technical article on improving the game of chess, in which he proposes, recommends, discusses, and finally rejects the possible innovation of eliminating one of the rook's pawns. This is a writer interested in games and in changing their rules, but it is also someone whose interests and obsessions do not obviously have a much wider impact beyond a small, and the narrator obliquely indicates eccentric, coterie of fellow writers and hangers-on. But Menard has also left behind another work, which is invisible, subterranean, and therefore easily overlooked. Nonetheless, the narrator claims that it is perhaps the most significant of our time. It consists of the ninth and thirty-eighth chapters of the first part of Don Quixote, and a fragment of chapter twenty-two. What Menard has written in short, is word for word a repetition of part of the masterpiece of the Spaniard Miguel de Cervantes, the first modern European novel. The redundancy of Menard's project is, on the face of it, obvious. We already, after all, have the Quixote. What could such a ridiculous enterprise achieve? But the narrator's claim citing as an example a couple of lines that otherwise differ by not an iota, is that a Quixote written by Cervantes is a product of its time, maybe to be expected, if we believe that the historical context determines the horizons of literary ambition. It is necessary and perhaps even unavoidable. By contrast, for a French symbolist poet of the early 20th century to write the very same text is a heroic achievement that goes against the grain of context and history. Where Cervantes merely expresses the spirit of his age, Manas Quixote is astounding in the way it goes against all we think we know now. The later text, then, which appears to be mere copy or imitation, is in fact almost infinitely richer. The like becomes unlike. The same is now radically distinct. Here, and in his many other games with time and infinity, and with much else besides, Borges is interested in asking what is the smallest difference that makes a difference. How, for instance, 
in Talon Akbar Orbis Tertius, a throwaway conversational remark, the conjunction of a mirror and an encyclopedia, might lead to the discovery of a vast transhistorical conspiracy to materialize an entirely other world. How, in the lottery in Babylon, we might imagine a society entirely governed by the exigencies of chance and fortune. He plays out, often fittingly, in very similar ways, examples of variation with unlimited repetition, that constitute, he suggests, the elusive conditions for true novelty, true change in a world in which what we believe to be major differences are too often revealed to be simply more of the same. And in the end, Borges's philosophical concerns lead him back to the issues of violence and power, margin and centre, past and present, and the seemingly inexorable advance of a particular form of urban modernity. For the question of how to make a difference, of the smallest difference that makes a real difference, is also a properly political question, perhaps the only political question that really counts. It is the question posed by the Russian revolutionary Vladimir Lenin. What is to be done? And the fact that Borges continues to ask it, despite all the odds, evidences his faith that there is always some play available in the labyrinths in which we find ourselves, in the linguistic and other fetters that bind us. He is the eternal optimist.